for joining me at Lines Plus Letter from my desk. Thank you so much for having me, Alina. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yay. So everyone, uh, Mariah is my editor for Marshmallow and Jordans. And I, I'm so honored that she's willing me to interview here because I feel like not many people know about the role of an editor in a book project. And since we are collaborate on Mushmer and Jordan, which is a middle grade graphic novel, so we are going to talk about what is an editor do for, at, on a graphic novel project. And um, maybe we can start with Mariah sharing with us um, insight about what an editor does, because I don't think most people know about it. And unfortunately, editor is not always celebrated as much as the author and illustrator of a book, so. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I think that there's a couple of different types of editors, in fact, and there are going to be editors who prefer to do one way or another, um, as opposed to an editor who works for a publishing company. I'm a freelance editor, but within the freelance editing space, there's also editors who edit a bunch of different things, some monthly comic books that might be coming out or maybe prefer to do graphic novels. And I've done both. And I learned that for me, I very much prefer to work on a longer term project with a smaller group. And I would love to work on the parts of editing that really help to refine the book and work on the language. And that really, for me, is more useful for somebody who is perhaps not of an American background, perhaps English is their second or third or fourth language, that I can help to do almost localization and keep it in the writer's voice, but also make it so that it's colloquially American for this kind of readership that if you're coming and you're publishing the book in the U.S. and it's a middle grades graphic novel, you do need to make sure that it's audience appropriate. So I edited a monthly ongoing Black Cloud, um, the first five issues of that, and that was a very interesting process. We might get into detail about that in a little bit, but it really made me learn that that kind of freelance editor is more of a project manager. And the kind of editing that I like to do is more the language crafting. And so I'm more on the side of somebody who would help to maybe beta read, um, give feedback on things and help to craft some of the language, make sure there's no plot holes, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely like my my most memorable experience working with you on much more and Jordan is English is my second language. And <laughs> in the beginning you were confused with what the heck I'm writing because I talk, you can understand the way I speak, but the way I write is confusing. And then we eventually discover is I'm written in British grammar <laughs> with American colloquial mixing and that confused the hell of everybody. And eventually we discuss and figure out, okay, this is how we are going to take care of this language issues. <laughs> I know exactly where I was in that moment when we had that sort of aha moment. Yeah. Um, it was in the summer, first summer of the pandemic in August of 2020, we had been working together on Marshmallow and Jordan for a while already. And suddenly we're going through and editing the entire book start to finish. And we go through the first pass and I'm sitting in a hotel in Healdsburg, California. And we talk about language and grammar and what would be more appropriate, what would be um, something that a reader might expect to hear, that we could infuse something of your grandparents' Indonesian culture into 
and what would be too confusing but really understanding oh right i definitely forgot that hong kong was a british colony and that you would have had an entirely british school experience I, I didn't have that. I had a very American school experience with a tiny bit of wonky German uh, or Austrian thrown in because I went to a Waldorf school. So yeah, um, that that definitely informs a bunch of what I do. And I think that's why I like a more extended project. That's actually one of the, the formats of Waldorf School is that you'll do a main lesson block. And instead of doing, you know, an hour on math and an hour on reading and an hour on writing and an hour, basically, you might spend half the day doing something and you do it half the day for two or three weeks straight. And then you'd move on to another main lesson block. So you're really absorbing in depth versus going from one thing to the next. And I went to the Waldorf School for first through fourth grade here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I am literally just now in this moment realizing how much that has informed how I prefer to learn and therefore how I prefer to work. Well, thank you for that epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I also learned a lot from this whole experience working with you closely editing much more on Jordan because that also made me so much more aware of even within the English language, there's different type of colloquial and grammar from different regions. So it's not that one is correct or the other is wrong. It's just we have to write in the voice that is suitable for the region of our target audience. So I learned a lot from that experience as well. Yes, it was really great. In terms of Marshmallow and Jordan, you couldn't have a better book to think about because the setting is at an international school. It is set in Indo Indonesia. However, not all of the students in the school are Indonesian. So you can really throw in some very like American teenage colloquialisms and neither one of us is a teenager. It's been some time, but thinking about that and then talking to my friend's kids, that, that was just a thrill. Um, I, I kind of felt cool for a minute there. And then now I have no idea what the kids are saying. The, the slang goes right over my head. I am officially an old on the internet. <laughs> Second question is, so your work on Marshmallow Jordan is a middle grade graphic novel. And I know you also worked on not, uh, comics that is targeted for adult readers. Uh, and one of them is Black Cloud, published by Image Comics. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the difference editing for a book that is for adult and then Another one like Marshmallow and Jordan is for a much younger reader. What's the difference in the editing experience and working on two different types of projects for different age group? That's a great question. One of the biggest differences actually isn't the audience at all. It's the format. Oh. Uh, I had mentioned that doing um, a comic book that comes out every month versus doing a graphic novel, it's... The graphic novel is a marathon and the monthly comic book is like a mini marathon every month. So sometimes uh, I would get just a little bit frustrated with the pace being more fast than I would prefer and mm -hmm. the monthly comics, you know, we got to get it done. It has to get out. It has to get to the publisher on a certain date. And I think that's great because I learned a lot about myself in this process. Black Cloud was the first uh, comic book that I edited, and it was a fantastic experience. I worked with some amazing people, um, Ivan Brandon, um, Jason Latour, Matt Wilson, Aditya Bidikar, the whole team was fantastic. 
working with you on Marshmallow and Jordan and also with the team at First Second, um, it was just, it was so different because of the length of time we had to do things in more so than what we were doing. And also because uh, I was working with two people who were writers already, um, that was something that they didn't need my help as much with. Whereas mm -hmm. for you, you come from an art background and Marshmallow and Jordan was really your first foray into writing at length. Yes. Which is such a different thing. And for somebody who this is your first uh, written and created book, all your own, it was such a learning and growing process yes. for both of us yes. at the same time, yes. I think. And I felt so much more useful to you. Like the team at Black Cloud, they needed me for some things, but they didn't need me in the same way that we worked together and that my help was more integral to the feel and the sound of Marshmallow and Jordan mm -hmm. than um, if you were reading a comic out loud. Black Cloud sounds very much like Ivan Brandon just his normal speaking voice to me mm. does mm. Uh, a little bit of other people but you know he invested a lot of himself in that book right. um even though you know we're talking about different characters different people there's there's just a way in which a certain turn of phrase is more known mm. maybe one person versus another and you have your preferences and those come through and that was the real joy is that we were working together so that your preferences and idiosyncratic tone mm -hmm. still come through, but wouldn't trip up a reader so that you get it when it's right and that it just gets smoothed a little bit. I'm not changing, not rewriting anything. Right. I'm working with you to craft the cleanest copy of the book that we could. Right, and it is my debut in, as author in in all show, right? It's not even just graphic novel. So it is, I'm still finding my voice when I'm writing my friend John and, and you definitely helped me a lot because it's not just figure out the colloquial language, it's also finding my voice as an author and you kind of have to carry some of that weight because it's debut, so I'm still searching for how am I going to do this? <laughs> and you, you are definitely a amazing support. And as I say to me, that's a amazing support from an editor. And the other thing is, author is such a, writing a book is such a solidarity kind of career. We can't talk about, even if I have a question, I hit a wall, I can't go around and talk about the content because it's NDA and I have to, the only person I can talk about is my editor and you have to carry a lot of my weight and stress, emotional support and everything. The solitary nature of writing is something that is both really, really good and necessary, but also terrible and really confining sometimes having a place where you can share your work and where you can get feedback is really important. And I know that you've been to workshops and you've workshopped work. I got my MFA in writing from University of San Francisco. I'm actually a poet. And the process of getting my MFA and going to writing workshops for a poetry, but also um, doing a basic autobiography, memoir class, and oh gosh, was that hard sometimes, because at the end of the day, you're right, it is solitary, and you're the only one who knows what the absolute right decision is, and 
me being able to come on board and talk to you and ask a bunch of questions to the point where I really understood the motivations for each of the characters, what was happening in this moment, the idea and the twist that you're going for, what's happening next in the story so that we're taking that all into account all the time. It's like um, you have a tiny Mariah sitting on your shoulder um, a little bit at the time. Yeah, and it helps when I feel like break up. I said, what should I do? How should I write this? And we have a lot of discussion how to balance some Indonesian vocabulary into the dialogue and how much to mix that in. And sometimes I'm, I just don't know. Let me ask Mariah. <laughs> yeah, I think the most important thing for me that came out of Marshmallow and Jordan, though, was knowing we went into this knowing each other beforehand we have some mutual friends and you showed at a gallery um that one of my best friends owned at that point and yet we come out of this very intense process that's just the two of us for like two years yes and we're better friends now than we were going in so there is something to say for working with somebody whose style you already like. I'm not saying that editors have to love everything. However, it certainly doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah, I agree. When you work with someone you know, it also feel more comfortable to discuss because writing, sometimes you have to put yourself in a very vulnerable spot and you want yeah. to be able to discuss some of those with someone you trust and know they will support you regardless and have your back. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of additional sensitivity is something that I always keep in mind because I know what it felt like to get my poetry critiqued in class. And that's sometimes the most personal writing a person can do. So every time I'm critiquing something, whether I'm beta reading for a friend or I'm editing something, I'm always thinking of the way to say it that will help the person the most to get to the best version of what they're creating. Because that's all we all want is to get to the best version so that what gets published is something that not just is good, but is good in a way that touches people. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, yeah. I know that you've certainly had some readers write in in ways that very much touched you. So that's almost the best reward for having written a book like Marshmallow and Jordan. Yeah. I, I get that vicariously. So all of you readers out there who send Alina kind notes, just know that she shares them with her editor and I very much love them as well. Oh, thank you, Mariah. And I should have bring to the next question because in the editing process, it's not just fixing technical issues in the manuscript, uh, not just fixing people's grammar or misspell or typo. There's more to it than just proofreading. Um, so when you edit for other people's writing and you edit for different people, different personality. How do you uh, maintain that writer's integrity and the voice and style beyond just fixing cycles? I think the most important thing is really listening, asking a lot of questions and finding out in this story, but also in life, what is the motivation of this person? What is the motivation of the characters that they have written? What is this world like? And specifically, what are each of the characters in this world doing? How are they interacting? Because if you know that, it's so much easier to help and maybe make a suggestion. Maybe Jordan's dad would say this instead of that. So I knew that even though Jordan's dad isn't entirely based on your dad, he's also a little bit based on your dad. 
and also that your dad has a bit of a goofy sense of humor and Jordan's dad has a bit of a goofy sense of humor. I love that kind of detail. That really helps me to help you and mm -hmm. anybody else that I'm working with. I want to have that more in-depth personal relationship that it's not always just about the writing that's on the page. It's about the subtext. It's about the denotation, not just the connotation. So I might ask a few more questions than maybe somebody else would. I don't know. Uh, I haven't been any other editors in my life. <laughs> and I, I've only talked to a few others and I think every editor brings themselves to the process. Mm. And I'm probably not the right editor for a whole bunch of people's work. But I am just so glad that I was the right editor for this book specifically. And maybe for something that's coming in the future. Yeah, definitely. And I, I like that you mentioned knowing that other person's background, knowing the author's background, how you add it. I, I have the same experience as illustrator for other people's books because in publishing, normally they don't introduce the illustrator and the author immediately. It's usually after you finish, but then whenever I get to work with author, I illustrate before. The second book, I always feel like that's more intimate because by then I already know that person. So when I read that manuscript, it's like, aha, I get that. <laughs> Instead of the first time working, I would try to look on social media, try to figure out who they are so I can interpret their manuscript from their perspective. But then once you know that person, you have that personal connection and you know where that story coming from and it makes a huge difference. I agree. Yeah. That, like from your perspective, illustrating something that somebody else has written, it is easier the longer you do it. Mm -hmm. So we edited Marshmallow and Jordan front to back, probably five, maybe six or seven times. Yes. And every time it got easier and yes, better. Definitely. Yeah. And the more we know each other through the process, it gets easier. I still remember the first draft is like, <laughs> a lot of talking <laughs> but then towards the last draft it's like oh, easy peasy yeah just here and there some more fixes here and there <laughs> I think one of the things that was so important to me was that I already loved your art I wanted your art to as it should in a comic book be doing some of the heavy lifting of the story so when it was possible to edit down and condense some of the um, speech bubbles, some of the captions, anything that we could take off the page because it's already in the illustration, that was one of the things that was really important to me. You don't need to say it twice. It's already on the page mm -hmm. in the picture. It doesn't need to be in a caption. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So. Um, this one is, do you have any fun or memorable behind the scenes story about Marshmallow Jordan that you would like to share or something that you haven't talked about, but want to bend it out, get off that, it's fine. <laughs> yes. So a little bit of background. Um, Alina used to live in the San Francisco Bay area and I used to see her all the time. She moved to LA and we didn't get to see each other all the time anymore and then we started working on marshmallow and jordan and one year i think it was a president's day weekend you drove up from la and we edited in this hotel room in right on the san francisco bay and my favorite was we would both be sitting looking at the computer and your dog piglet would be on the bed behind us looking highly aggrieved that neither one of us was paying <laughs> attention to her. And when it was finally time to take Piglet for a walk, 
she was so excited. And we came back in after the walk. You know, she's a little tired. She could still have some more energy. We sat down to edit again and Piglet started barking. <laughs> Why? Because we weren't paying any attention to her anymore again, of course. So <laughs> there's one point at which you picked up Piglet. You have her on your lap. I took a picture of the two of you um, with Snapchat. That's, that's how long ago this was. Snapchat was kind of relevant then. Um, and I have this picture. I'm going to see if I can dig it up. If I can, I'll send it to you and you can put it on the screen. It is one of those, um, you know, they kind of give you a little bit of a filter and it's just the cutest picture of you and Piglet. And at a time when Piglet was very much annoyed with the both of us, but it turned out to be so cute. And every time I see that picture, I think of that day and the way that Piglet was and how much Piglet became a character in this book, even though she's only a teensy little bit in the background of a picture, a double page spread. She's still throughout the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, Marshmallow also inherits some of Piglet personality too. <laughs> exactly. Everything about Marshmallow that's a little bit, um, as you would say, bratty. Yeah. Um, a little yeah. bit like, oh, mom. Anything the Marshmallow does like that, it's very Piglet. Stealing <laughs> <laughs> food from the table. <laughs> mm, yes. Yes. Marshmallow did sneak some food, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, he's good at stealing food. <laughs> you couldn't ask for a cuter elephant, really. Oh, thank you. So what are some of your favorite comics or graphic novel? Oh, there's so many. One of the reasons I started working in comics is because I was going to conventions because I already loved comics. I started reading comics as a kid. I had no idea where it was going. I, I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. I got a lot of five and 10 cent issues from the bins that are usually now called the dollar bins um, some time ago. And so I read a lot of 1970s Wonder Woman growing up. I also had somebody who when I was 10, give me probably the most important comic in terms of making me think about longevity and length, and that's ElfQuest. You know, Wendy and Richard Penny. Wendy Penny's art made me feel like I was part of the world. Um, in Wonder Woman, there's so many ways that I connected with this character who is a bit of a fish out of water. Um, you know, my first issue of Wonder Woman, I, I still remember to this day, it's a cover where Wonder Woman is throwing off her tiara and, and the, the speech bubble um, says, I've had enough of man's world. And I really deeply feel that, Diana Prince, I feel that. Um, but my favorite Wonder Woman now versus the Wonder Woman I read when I was a kid, very different. Uh, Comics has come a long way since the 1970s. And the Wonder Woman arc that was written by Greg Rucka and illustrated alternately by Nicholas Scott and Liam Sharp, that is my ideal Wonder Woman. And then just uh, in the past two years, Wonder Woman Historia came out. It's by Kelly Sue DeConnick as the writer, um, Phil Jimenez, Jean Ha, and Nicholas Scott each illustrated um, one of the issues. As a whole, these two takes on Wonder Woman and the Wonder Woman universe, how it sort of began, really inform the way I look at what makes a comic good mm. because that's not the only thing by Greg Greca that I've read it's not the only thing by Nicholas Scott that I've read and certainly not the only thing by Kelly Sue DeConnick that I've read I 
have a tattoo. This is the C in bitch from Bitch Planet. So I love Bitch Planet enough that I got it tattooed on my body. Bitch Planet is definitely a comic for adults, um, whatever age you deem that to be. Uh, it is fantastic. And it is written by Kelly Sue DeConnick and illustrated by uh, Valentine DeLandro and a whole slew of other artists. You should go and look at like the Wikipedia page about it. It's so fascinating um, what the choices are that they um, brought to that book. And I like thinking about that. So when I'm reading comics now, I'm reading it like 90% as a reader, but that 10% of my brain is thinking, what can I use this idea in in the future? Is mm -hmm. this something that I should send to X, Y, Z, you know, whoever I'm thinking of that that idea might match with? So let me just give a couple more and then I'll send you a list. You can put it up. Yes. Um, but I love Stumptown. I love Black Magic, The Coldest City. That's uh, Anthony Johnson and Sam Hart. And a movie was based on The Coldest City. Um, it's called Atomic Blonde. Maybe some people have seen that movie with Charlize Theron. So good. Anyway, definitely worth reading the original graphic novel. Um, Umbral. Umbral is the first really YA book that's on the list. It is also by Anthony, Anthony Johnston and Christopher Mitten on art. It is just fantastic. I was sad that it ended, um, but not every comic can be an ongoing for the length of, you know, Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman. There's indie comics and um, creator-owned comics are super important, but they don't bring in some of the big bucks like some of these uh, capes and tights books might. Um, and Bandette is Colleen Cooper's idea. Oh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just so much fun. If you like Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, you'll like Bandette and you might like Bandette more than Carmen Sandiego. I'll, I, I do. Um, and Catwoman, I read a lot of Catwoman when I was younger, um, but recently, Catwoman, Lonely City by Cliff Chang. As a person who's getting towards uh, a certain midlife milestone, let me just say that having an older woman be the entire center of a whole story was fantastic. Mm. Um, then there's Paper Girls and Monstrous, Captain Marvel and Ms. Marvel. That was a whole cultural event um, about a decade ago. Um, and then Emma Rios, literally everything that Emma writes or paints or draws is my favorite. I love everything. But if you have to choose, get Pretty Deadly, ID, and Mirror. Um, Becky Cloonan, love everything that Becky does, especially love the things that she writes and draws herself. Um, mm -hmm. Fiona Staples, she's pretty famous because of Saga, but like I would follow Fiona into the dark. It's fine. I, I love her. Um, Colleen Duran, and I mentioned Wendy Penny earlier. I think I really love art and artists and I will follow an artist first. So if an artist I really love stops drawing uh, an ongoing book, I, I might not continue reading it. Uh, <laughs> it depends. Maybe I'll love the next artist as much, but it's Nicholas Scott is a hard act to follow. I'll just say that. Mm. Wow, that's a wonderful list. And I know it's hard to keep track of those in the audio. So make sure you read the post to get all the book lists from Mariah. 
Okay, Mariah, next question. This is like one of my favorite questions I ask everyone. Uh, if you could stay in a graphic novel or comic universe for a day, which book are you going to choose? Wonder Woman Year One uh, by Greg Rucka and Nicholas Scott. It's just beautiful. And also the idea of living in Themyscira. <sighs> yeah, who would love that? Awesome, awesome. And okay, the next question is there's a lot of young aspiring, uh, aspiring writer and editors out there. What would be your advice for someone who would like, love to have a writing career as an editor or as an author? Just start writing. Honestly, I didn't know that I wanted to be an editor when I started writing, but being a writer or an artist or both will make you a better editor. And if you want to start doing comics, the best way in is to start just making comics for yourself, for your friends, for you know, a, a web comic, if you wanted to do that. There's so many ways in. Don't let anyone gatekeep you and let you think that you can't do it. The only thing I would say is do not uh, become a comic book writer or artist because you think you're going to make it rich. You, probably not. It, you have to really love it to do it, I think. And it certainly can pay the bills, but um, <laughs> I have a full-time day job and I am a freelance editor. There are some freelance editors who edit multiple books, maybe six or seven or eight, um, and they can make that work for them. I prefer to have the security of my full-time day job and have health insurance. Mm -hmm. So um, think about the things that you want and the things that you need and what you are willing to give up and what you are not able to make any compromises on because knowing that will help you decide, is this something I love to do? Is this something I love to do enough to do it as a career? Mm -hmm. Because on top of the day-to-day -day of writing or editing, there might be conventions. Most comic book artists that I know make more money from selling their original art, maybe at conventions or online, than they do from the book itself. Mm. There are certainly some who make a really good page rate, and I advocate and want to let anybody who's doing this know that you need to decide what number you won't go under and be able to say no to projects that mm. are lowballing you. Do not ever work for exposure. Exposure is what kills people in the cold in Minnesota in the winter. Don't let it be what kills a comic book writer or artist. Mm, that's excellent advice there. Um, and last question is, are you currently accept any new project or if so, what's the best way to contact you for potential collaboration? I would be willing to accept short-term projects. In terms of larger projects, like perhaps a graphic novel, I have my time and my spoons as a person who also has a chronic illness sort of allocated to your next project. Um, so whatever it is, I'm always happy to get an email or a message on Blue Sky and we can talk about it. Um, I love to beta read for people um, uh, as somebody. So I have multiple sclerosis. If you're writing a character who has MS, I'd love to be a sensitivity reader. And um, I love to give things a first pass. And also, if you just want a flat out copy editor, 
I'm your girl. I will find all the commas places and um, make sure that all the spelling is Americanized. <laughs> um, there's there's some real interesting, as we've talked about, differences between British and American grammar. Yes. And um, yeah, so long story short, kind of, kind of, but really, I will want to know who you are as a person in order to work with you on a project. That's great. And I, uh, we will post Mariah's social media contact in the post as well. So make sure also read the post. <laughs> and thank you today, Mariah, for joining me on my Substack. Um, it has been wonderful. We get to talk about books and share about your experience as an editor. And I know there's a lot of reader and audience out there would like to would benefit from your talk today. So thank you so much. It was my pleasure, Alina. I always love talking with you and talking about the things that make comics better and can make other people understand the comics process better because I think when you understand something better you can love it more deeply definitely and also I think it's just wonderful to have the reader also learn more about editing process because it's definitely one of the most important process in any book publishing any type of books but not many people understand and know exactly what that process is and what an editor do and there's sometimes there's misunderstanding thinking or oh, editing is just fixing typos which is not quite just that so I think it's just wonderful for, as a learning experience for many readers as well so thank you so much you're very welcome and hello to all the readers it was a pleasure to get to be here and so you could hear a little bit about what's going on and don't be shy to message me on blue sky or something like that if you want to and um make sure you also if you like the post comment below and if you post any question in the comment um maybe mariah will answer your question too <laughs> so follow us and follow her on her social media handle we are posted in the Lot here and thank you everybody see you guys next time